Welcome to Young Adults Learning Evil, hosted by Nai Rule. Young Adults Learning Evil is a gritty documentary podcast that explores the intersectionality of class, wealth, and race, and how it has played out over the past 400 years within a community. The podcast gives the world insight into how urban trauma affects a marginalized Black community inside one of America's first planned cities, New Haven, Connecticut. New Haven is also the home of one of the world's most prestigious and powerful institutions, Yale University. Subscribe to Young Adults Learning Evil on your favorite podcast platform. Here is your host, Nairul. Peace. This is Nairul, and you are listening to Young Adults Learning Evil. The title of this episode is Yale University, The Birth of a Nation. In this episode, we will explore the founding of Yale University, human trafficking, and the birth of America. Yale University is a very powerful academic institution. Even that is an understatement. There are few institutions that have produced as many leaders of industries, politics, and science with power and influence. If they are able to amass this much power globally, just imagine the amount of power they hold locally at their base. The relationship between New Haven and Yale, referred infamously as Town and Gown, started from its conception. One of the founders, John Davenport, a Puritan clergyman and human trafficker, wanted to create a college to educate ministers for the people in the new colonies. Davenport went to Edward Hopkins, also a human trafficker and relative to Theophilus Eaton and also the governor of Connecticut Colony, who saw the vision and made a sizable donation towards the education of residents in the New Haven Colony. Around this same time, a death warrant was signed for King Charles. And then when the restoration of the monarchy came, the signers became fugitives. Three of those regicides came to New Haven looking for a safe haven. John Davenport assisted the regicides because he was against the Anglican Church. This, in my opinion, were the precursors to the American independence movement. After Hopkins died, he left his estate to Davenport, who wanted to see his vision play out. The grammar school did not go well in New Haven. The families were not interested. He was able to open up a college preparatory school, but that too also failed. Davenport felt that Christ's interest in New Haven was miserably lost. Many of the ministers and clergymen in New Haven, like John Davenport, were involved with human trafficking and holding African hostages. The college prep school that Davenport set up for Hopkins is still open to this day. But when Hopkins died, The money for the college went to Harvard University, but the dream for a Connecticut college did not die with Davenport. 30 years from his death, a young Harvard graduate named James Pierpont came to New Haven. He entered into John Davenport's pastoral collective and married his widowed daughter-in-law. He took up Davenport's mission by buying his land and the books that he left as endowments to the future Connecticut college. Pierpoint and many of his fellow Harvard graduates came to New Haven to help proceed Davenport's vision. They all consolidated power with the local clergy, and as founders, they created the Charter for Connecticut College for the purpose of teaching the youth to be fitted for public employment, both in church and civil state. Which goes back to my opening statement about how powerful and far-reaching Yale alumnus are. This decision was made at the house of Abraham Pearson, where the original trustees and founders of Yale gathered, along with their hostages as servants. The founders needed assistance in putting the college together. They wrote a letter to the Mathers brothers, Increase and Cotton. Cotton was the president of Harvard before he was ousted. The founders of Connecticut College needed help setting up a Bible college and the Mathers obliged to assist them. The college continued to struggle, 
until another Harvard alumni stepped in to save the struggling collegiate school. That was Jeremiah Doomer, the Harvard grad who left for England after graduation. He is considered in history as the first American as he championed the independence and the uniqueness of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and later the Connecticut Colony. Doomer assisted Pierpont by delivering a large parcel of books, ranging from topics of British royal papers, religion, poetry, and science. He also sent a parcel of books from a governor of Madras, India, named Elihu Yell, who is related to the merchant founder of New Haven, Theophilus Eaton. So there's an intertwine, like I said, between town and gown. There's a family connection and also an ideological connection. Yale was also a human trafficker, like Theophilus Eaton. In India, he was known as a notorious human trafficker who took advantage of a drought in the Madras region and brought 300 slaves. He then shipped them to British colonies in the Atlantic. Now, this is how you find Indian culture in the Caribbean. They were called coolies, which is considered a derogatory term by some, but the word was originally used to describe the hats they wear while working in the sun. It is also the name of a Hindu ethnic group and a Tamil word that means wages. I just find it interesting that Elihu Yell played an instrumental part in bringing Indian hostages to the British Atlantic colonies. He also imposed a law that every ship bound for a British colony or Britain must have at least 10 hostages on it. He is responsible for shipping Indian hostages across the Indian Ocean also to places like Sumatra and Madagascar. He was known to hang Indian citizens and silence his opposition with death. He can be seen in paintings at the Yale Art Gallery with a small Tamil boy being held hostage with a collar around his neck like an animal. In the Yale revisionist history, Doomer doesn't exist. The narrative is that Mather wrote to Elihu Yale for assistance and told him that if he gives a sizable donation, that his name will be memorialized. So Elihu Yale took the profits he made from human trafficking and opiate distribution and gave less than what his wealth permitted. The timing of the gift allowed the trustees to use Yale's name as the founder instead of Jeremiah Doomer. Neither have set foot on American soil since the conception of the idea, and both died without ever seeing their vision come to fruition. When Yale College opened its doors, it had only one rector and one tutor. The first rector of Yale College was a human trafficker and hostage holder, and also a Harvard alumni, Alicia Williams. And the first tutor was Jonathan Edwards, a human trafficker and the future president of New Jersey College, which was later named Princeton. Now the college has its name, it has its books, and it has its land. Now all they needed was funding for the library. The first scholarship fund was created by Bishop George Berkeley, whom Berkeley College on Yale's campus is named after. He was a human trafficker who owned a plantation in Rhode Island. When he left the American colony, he left the plantation to Yale College, who in turn rented it out to Charles Handy, who used African hostages to work the plantation to provide money for Yale. According to records, Berkeley purchased two hostages and baptized three hostages at a ceremony. The census records show that Charles Handy owned four slaves which may have included the slaves Berkeley purchased. Berkeley shared a popular sentiment when discussing Christianity and human trafficking. I have to quote him directly. It would be of advantage to their affairs to have slaves who should obey in all things their masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart as fearing God, but Gospel liberty consists with temporal servitude, and that their slave would only become better slaves by being Christian. So I'll let you digest that. Now, plantations at that time were being worked by African hostages, 
and that was all over the colonies. It was a stratified between north and south. There were plantations in the north and there were plantations in the south and they were both worked by African hostages. Next, the school needed books. So the Reverend Jared Elliott, one of the original students of Yale College and successors to Pierpont's pulpit, was a human trafficker and he held two African hostages. When he died, he left the money he made off the labor of these hostages to a library fund, which eventually became the Sterling Library. And the first endowment for professorship was given by Philip Livingston, who at that time was considered one of New York's biggest human traffickers. He inherited hostages from his father and his in-laws and continued the family business. He donated silver that was used to fund their first professorship. Till this day, the professorship seat is named after Livingston. Every aspect of Yale's growth was funded by human trafficking and the labor of African hostages. The Yale founders and contributors used intellectual arguments to justify their evil deeds. Yale College was effective in creating clergy, but it was future Yale president Ezra Stiles that had the vision of creating Yale University. Ezra Stiles, also a clergyman that practiced human trafficking, he would send raw goods to Africa and the Caribbean in exchange for African hostages. There is record of him ordering specific African hostages. He ordered a Negro, 12 to 15 years old, straight limb and docile temperament. He named this hostage, once he received him, Newport, after the city he bore him in. But this is a 12 year old boy, he already had a name. Ezra Stiles held him hostage until the age of 30. And that's when Ezra was hired to be the president of Yale College. As we spoke about in earlier episodes, life of freed Africans in New England in the 1700s was difficult. And Newport ended up traveling to New Haven and became Ezra Stiles indentured servant because he couldn't take care of himself. And he gave his wife and his son to be servants also. And his son was to be Ezra Stiles servant until he turned 24, which was part of the gradual manumission clause. And at that time, his son was only three. Ezra Stiles promoted the Noah stories and Talmudic teachings of the Curse of Ham, which says people of the dark race are destined to serve the children of Shem and Japhet. Ezra Stiles considered the Puritans as the sons of Japhet, and that is how he justified the institution of slavery. He thought it was ordained by God. New Haven and Yale were both established well before the United States of America. Many of its founders and early alumni molded America to what it is today. There were 14 Yale alumni present at the Continental Congress and four alumni that signed the Declaration of Independence. One of them was the human trafficker John Edwards. Yale's contribution to America can't be overstated. They also relied on human trafficking and the labor of hostages and used their power, influence, and intellect to perpetuate the institution of slavery. By the end of the 1700s, plantations were declining. And then, the hostage of a Yale alumni and New Haven resident, Black Sam, changed the world with his invention of the cotton gin. So that's the end of this presentation. Join the Facebook group, Young Adults Learning Evil Podcast. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Peace. Thank you. For listening to Young Adults Learning Evil, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. 
Visit our Patreon page and learn how you can support and stay in tuned with the movement. Till next time, peace.